Welcome to Muskegon Rising, a community service project of the Muskegon Rotary Club. Our purpose is to create lasting positive change. We've been doing that here since 1916. So let's get started. Hello and welcome to Muskegon Rising, a podcast supported by the Muskegon Rotary Club. I'm your host, Aaron Mikey, and today I'm here with Kirk Holman from the Muskegon Museum of Art. Welcome, Kirk. Thank you. So glad to have you here. So much yeah. exciting things going on with art in Muskegon. How did the museum actually start? Interesting story. It goes back to 1905. Uh, Charles Hackley um, put an extra sentence in his will saying he wanted to leave, oh, I think $150,000 to purchase pictures of the best kind. And... Um, Great. What do you do with that? You know, and um, so the public schools at the time who um, own the Hackley Public Library, I mean, a lot of people don't know that for a long time, uh, Muskegon Public Schools created and owned both the Art Museum and Hackley Public Library, um, decided to start um, putting, buying paintings of contemporary artists to put in their upstairs gallery, which is now the children's area. And, you know, contemporary artists at that time were the iconic names of American art now. And uh, they started buying those pictures, and they put a few up there. They thought, eh, you know, this isn't really quite working up here. Let's build an art gallery next door. So they borrowed maybe, I think, $40,000 from that fund and built the 1912 edition of the uh, Muskegon Museum of Art called the Hackley Art Gallery then. And they kept buying more paintings. So we had this little collection before they even opened the art gallery. And they hired a director um, from Chicago, who was originally from London, Raymond Wire, who uh, um, they used to buy these pictures. He kept buying the pictures. He kept buying bigger pictures. He bought a, a whistler, and it got him fired from the school board. And uh, then the school board started, keep, they kept on buying pictures, you know, so... Um, That's how it started. And, uh, you know, about a decade ago, we went independent, uh, finally raised our own endowment, went independent of the public schools, but we're still very connected. So there's not a lot of communities who can point to their public school system to say they built a world-class library and a world-class art museum. Power of one sentence. One sentence. I mean, if you don't think, you know, legacy giving, you know, in a little sentence can make a change, that's, that's huge. So tell us about the collection of art yeah. at the, muse- at the mu- museum uh, and, and what it entails. Obviously not every piece, but it is yeah. truly world class. It is. Um, there's about 5,000 plus pieces in the collection. It's growing all the time. I think we're probably now up to 5,500 in the past couple of years. It's always been an aggressive Lee collecting art museum from its very beginnings. Um, the third director, um, Frank Almy, from the late 20s through the 1950s, collected a lot of our masterpieces. You know, we have, you know, only uh, art museum in Michigan to have an Edward Hopper, and uh, he's about the top of the scale as you can get for American artists. But at the time, he was a contemporary artist, and uh, other people said, I don't know if you want to buy this guy. You might not have, we don't know much about him, you know, so they paid a little bit of money, you know, for a, you know, a iconic painting. And that happened over and over. And I think in the 1950s and 60s, we kind of went to sleep a little bit as far as collecting. But in the 70s and even today, we still aggressively collect. Um, so this collection is quite spectacular. Um, we don't go out and buy iconic pieces because nobody can afford those if you see the art, art market. So the trick is to buy contemporary artists or, you know, pieces that fill in gaps that really complement the collection. And we will be unveiling one piece with the expansion that is um, quite spectacular. Actually, two pieces that are worthy of any major art museum. So I think the community is going to be quite surprised. That's awesome. How does our museum in Muskegon compare to museums in cities of like size? I don't know if there's a comparison for our museum um, for cities of our population and size. Um, In fact, when it opened in 1912, no city our size had ever built an art museum. So it was in like the London Times, the New York Times. But, um, you know, what we can say is that cities much bigger than Muskegon do not have art museums like this. I mean, it's really unique that Muskegon has this caliber of art right in its midst. 
obviously you're part of the community, uh, just really entrenched right downtown. Yeah. Uh, lots of supporters. But how important do you think art is in really building, supporting, and developing a community? It's very important this today more than ever. I mean, um, you know, some museums used to be, and we probably have gone through that period decades ago, you know, you have pictures on the wall, people come in, but if you're not part of the community on every different level, um, helping the business community with economic impact, um, um, the public schools, the programming, um, elder care, I mean, right down the line, art museums and museums in general now do a lot more than they ever used to do to keep the community engaged. Um, we do probably 15 rotating exhibitions a year, which is kind of crazy by any art museum standards, but that's how we get people coming back in. We like to make exhibitions that connect the community and sometimes even make them part of the exhibition. Um, we're really entrenched with the school systems. We have, you know, programs we raise money for, like Aesthetic Ed, to get kids um, used to an art experience before they come to an art museum. It's a different kind of thing, which we don't have time to go in here now. But um, and on the, the economic side of it, tourism is important. Um, now, with everyone working from home, it's hard for companies to recruit and retain employees. So how do you get someone from New York or Chicago to move to Muskegon? So I think the combination of the art and cultural life and the lakeshore and the amenities we have in, the, uh, in nature, um, it's a really powerful combination. But we, we work with human resource people. Um, we regularly have people coming through looking at not only us, but all the other arts and culture in the town and what we have going on to make people move here. I mean, it's, and, and retain them. It's, it's, it's really important. So It certainly is. And what an opportunity for companies to reward their employees, giving yep. them memberships, encouraging them to uh, visit the museum. It, it's just such a treasure. We also have a growth of public art in, Mus in yeah. Muskegon. And uh, there's a portal coming up right, or that's being yeah. built right now. It's already and, done, yeah. It's done. Yeah. Uh, the water drop out by the beach, um, the trumpeter. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a piece in Muskegon Heights. How does that fit with the museum, and, and what are your thoughts on that? Um, it fits more closely than most people think. Um, it's the Downtown Arts Committee, the Muskegon Public Art Initiative, which you're talking about, which is putting all these big pieces up. It's a Committee um, of the Community Foundation. I chair it, and Judy Hayner is the uh, basically the director of it. And um, it was it had been around, and we had been doing art pieces. But um, a uh, philanthropist, Patrick O'Leary, who many people know, who um, didn't spend a lot of time in Muskegon, but was impactful for him. He's now off in Arizona. He decided to come up with this project where he would plant the seed money for ten sculptures. So. Um, that's gone very well. It's all privately funded, and um, Portal was number nine, and we have um, one we are working on now, looking for artists, looking for where it's going to go. We kind of know where it's going to go, but an announcement will be made in the next few months about where the last of the ten is going. But again, that's so complementary to everything we do, and it just uh, enriches the community and all the things I just spoke of before. Um, we're now known as an arts community. You know, it's that's pretty great. It's really amazing. And, and they just beautify everything. They make mm -hmm. the city feel more welcoming. Yep. Uh, they know that we're dedicated to the arts in this community. Yep. And I really, really appreciate your Lots work on that. Lots of intangibles, yeah. So really the big news is your expansion. Yeah. Tell our listeners about what's going on. Uh, this is a big one. We are very close to finishing. Um, we are probably going to finish construction uh, three months. Uh, we'll spend January getting it ready and then open to the public in February. But we are adding um, 26,000 square feet. So we'll be about uh, 56,000, 58,000 square foot art museum. Um, it's a really simple expansion, but it's one we desperately need because we just don't have any capacity anymore, especially for the big touring shows, which we do so well. We don't have the footprint, but this will be four new galleries. One is a giant 5,000 square foot gallery where we can, like next summer, we'll put the Julia Child immersive experience in there. We have a Disney show, a comic show, um, a lot of big stuff going there scheduled through the end of 2027. 
uh, two galleries on the second new second floor to do um, our rotating shows and a and a gallery uh, in the basement off the lobby that will um, uh, show um, um, our works on paper. It's a special gallery with, with UV resistant lighting and all that kind of stuff because we have a lot of works on paper and you can't get those up for a long time. They have to go out and rest, but now we can have them out. So. Um, we're converting an upstairs gallery to our glass collection, which we've never been able to get out except for special occasions. We're adding two new classrooms, which we desperately need, a new gift store, connecting space, an event space, which we don't have a dedicated event space, um, and downstairs, new collection storage that should, uh, it's huge, um, 3,000 square feet that should last us 80 years, you know, a lot, because we have a lot of artwork coming in, so... And a little bit of staff support space for back-of-house stuff. But it's a pretty big deal. Um, it was a fifth, it's about, the project's about $15.4 million. Um, we've raised it. We need a little bit more but um, to put some bells and whistles on. But, you know, we're pretty much there. Um, it was supposed to be a $10 million project. Um, and every price check was good until we went out to bid and the whole uh, COVID economy kicked in for construction and it went up to like $16, $17 million. So we had to value engineer some stuff out of it, um, but not compromise the program. Uh, we lost a rooftop terrace, which we're not too heartbroken over there if you've been up in that heat lately. But uh, um, this is going to be a major economic driver for Muskegon, Muskegon County and the region. Um, the shows we're going to be able to do. And uh, if you make any comparisons to other cities, um, we'll have about 19,000 square feet of exhibition space. Um, Graham has 20, so it will be very comparable to the Graham in that respect. But the key is to fill it with really impactful programming, um, the community, uh, great exhibitions, and more of our permanent collection, which we can only get out a fraction the way it is now. That's amazing. And I, I had a behind-the-scenes tour a couple months yeah. ago. and. Uh, there was still dust on the floor, but you can just yeah. truly envision what those spaces are going to be and how beautiful the art is going to look. And to be able to have some of that permanent collection out yeah. more often is so exciting instead of having mm -hmm. it behind the scenes. And the workroom that you are going to have the art in the storage room, oh my goodness, you don't understand, or I didn't understand, all the backbone that you have to have to support what's public facing. Absolutely. And, you know, we're, we are accredited um, by the national organization at the highest level. And that means it's just not about storage space. It's about high-end humidity controls, temperature controls. Everything's recorded. And if we're bad, our machines tell on us to our accreditation agency. So um, there's a pretty high standard for that stuff. So um, um to have more of that kind of space where we can really grow is kind of a dream come true. Now I walk back there and I, I just, you know, it's been six years since we decided we're going to, you know, press the go button on this project. And I can't believe we're this close to being done. I mean, uh, sometimes you don't see the forest for the trees, but it's real now. It's really real. It certainly yeah. is. As a, as a downtown neighbor, it's amazing yeah. to watch that progress and it'll be so exciting to yeah. see that finalized. So congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. So as a nonprofit, community-based yep. museum of art, fundraising is key. You mentioned $15.4 mm -hmm. million being raised. How do you raise money? Uh, we knock on a lot of doors in a cycle after cycle after cycle. I mean, we have a few fundraising events, our gala um, and a Festival of Trees and On Tap. Those are, you know, and, and that, you know, do, doesn't do uh, too bad for us, but most of it, we have to raise probably for operations at least $900,000 a year by just sponsorships, uh, memberships. Um, this is not earned revenue, um, these events, um, donations, gifts, on and on and on. And that's quite a lot every year. But the great thing about it is we've built up a, a wonderful membership base, donor base, and they as long as you're doing, you have a strong program and people are believing in what you're doing, you know, people want to participate and help make these things happen. You know, our sponsorship program is, is, is pretty strong and um, it's, it's been a long time, uh, a long time to develop it. But, um, you know, this is a generous community and it's not only us, so many other organizations this town have 
uh, really strong sponsorship programs. And, you know, we did all those capital campaigns together, us, the symphony, uh, community foundation, et cetera, et cetera, and they were all successful. It's a special community that way. It truly is. Very generous, very collaborative. Uh, it, it's a unique community. It is. So you mentioned membership. Mm -hmm. There are varying membership opportunities. Just as an, a public individual, what does a membership cost for me to join? Uh, it's a little as fifty dollars for a, a um, uh, individual, like a member plus guest is seventy five. We have sales for new members all the time, you know. Um, the sweet spot's really that friend level at one twenty five because you can travel the country and get into a thousand museums for free. It's a reciprocal program we have, so you can go to the Phillips, you can go to the Frick, San Francisco Museum of Fine Arts for free if you're traveling. So there's a level for everybody, you know. It's um, um, it's, it's a pretty straightforward program, but you get in for free, you know, and you get invitations to all the cool events and that sort of stuff. So for as yeah. little as $50, I can yep. get in to a world-class museum. Or 120 if I'm traveling, I can get in yep. around the United States. Yep. Oh, my goodness. That's amazing. Yeah, it pays for itself pretty quick. It certainly does. How do you engage in the community? Uh, many ways. You know, we have a small staff of probably 11 full-time people. and even though we have a full-time educating education programming person this we're all about trying to engage in the community every every staff member so um a lot of it is a lot of it's for education programs which i've mentioned recently um but um when we do an exhibition it's just not about throwing something up on the wall it's like what programming can we put around that um and how we can we make the community a part of it. Uh, you know, one thing is like the hands exhibition we did where we actually went out and sought kind of unsung heroes um, who weren't maybe the big philanthropists, the, you know, um, the movers and shakers, but people in little corners of Muskegon County, what they're doing, uh, the impact they're having, photographing their hands, telling the story, and then that makes them part of the exhibition. So we like doing things like that, you know. Um, we are doors are always open for a company, for an organization to have an event at the museum. Um, you know, we're pushovers, you know, we don't charge much money, if any at all, if it's the right event. We like to have people come in and get engaged and use the art museum for, you know, either of your company it can help your bottom line. If you're an organization, you know, it's a great atmosphere to bring your donors into whatnot. So, and we can do a lot more of that with the expansion. So, any way we can engage with any group of people, I mean, we're all for it. That's outstanding. And I see you all over. You're in the Rotary Club. And, of course, the Public Art Initiative is truly amazing, it too. Is, so, yeah. Youth at the museum, you've mentioned that a little bit. I had the fortune of having one of my sons, I won't call it a piece, it was something uh, that he did in, yeah. I think, third grade. And you highlight all of the art of these young people. Yeah. Uh, bring their parents in. Bring those kids in. Um, I'm not sure you want to invest in my son's art to buy that. You never know. But, but yeah. you never know. I think yeah. that's a great point. So what's, yeah. what does that look like with youth? Uh, not just the event that I talked about, but yeah. how do you bring them in? What, what do right. you do with them? Well, like I say, we have a full-time uh, curator of education who's kind of in charge of all that. But again, the whole staff is in charge of that. And what you're talking about, is our uh, Muskegon County uh, student exhibition where we work with all the area schools, uh, home schools, uh, et cetera, et cetera, public and private, and the art teachers curate, and we treat it just like a big-time art exhibition. And the stuff's really remarkable, and it's a partnership with the ISD, and um, we put it up, we give them a gallery experience. We have, this is probably the one uh, reception we have, and we do it over two nights, it's that crowded, where it's when we get new people in the art museum, the parents of the kids and relatives. So it's great on multiple levels. But we also have a lot of um, uh, student programs. Our aesthetic ed program, which I mentioned, um, was developed at the Lincoln Center. And it trains kids to prepare them for an arts experience, not just art museum, but maybe civic theater, the symphony. So when they come in, uh, they're automatically engaged with the art. They're excited to engage in the art. And we have to, we train teachers, we have teaching artists that come in. And uh, we've been doing this program for many years. It'll, one thing it does, it um, engages the next generation of art enthusiasts. The other thing it does is it kind of 
it's like teaching kids how to contemplate. So it's not like they're going to go back and be better at art, but they'll go back to school and their brain will just slow down and they can apply this to math, to history, to English. So it's a very important program that way. Um, How Met for years has been funding our free Saturdays for kids called Super Saturdays with activities, STEM programs, uh, films, tours. That's been constant. And, you know, our partnerships with Muskegon Public Schools are ongoing. Um, basically, one of our classrooms will be a Muskegon Public Schools classroom, so we can do stuff, more stuff with aesthetic ed, with, more with tours. Um, the design of the building is such that uh, the new Webster Street entrance is really designed. It's temporary now, but it'll make sense to people coming in when I say this. It's the sloped with the wall entry sidewalk is for it school buses. Kids can line up. Our old gift store will be converted into a staging area. Kids will come in, sit down. They won't have any time for their mind to wander. They'll be immediately engaged, and they turn the corner into the new education wing um, right there. So um, we're kind of um, designed now to do more with education. So we do spring break programs, um, camps, it's constant and lots of school tours during the years from not just Muskegon, but surrounding counties. So And we'll be doing more because now we have the capacity to finally do more. And finally, we're going to have all, you know, all hours drop in family activity area for kids that you don't have to buy a ticket. You can just come in and do the activities um, and all the educational programs that are connected to the exhibitions instead of finding a corner for them like we always had to do in the past. So we'll we'll keep growing with the school systems. I absolutely love that, engaging with the kids. And I, I, again, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, they may not become an artist, but I think it gives them the perspective of what it takes to be an artist, the dedication, right. whether it's visual art, musical art, performing arts. It really is a skill. It is. It really is. And having everybody appreciate that and, uh, and understand its value in a community yeah. is what you're doing. Yeah. And also, you know, post-secondary, um, our donors very generously step forward, and they're totally funding our internship program now. So we're getting a lot of college kids in, and uh, they, we kind of take them through. They'll spend some time in curatorial development if they want. I never want to do that for some reason. Um, education, um, but we get them really hands-on and have them do real projects. So now we've had more interns than we've ever had before from the different colleges. So that's quite exciting. So, Kirk, is there anything that we haven't covered that you'd like our listeners to know about? Well, I guess, you know, in, immediately, um, we're crazy enough that we're not shutting the museum down during this construction. So we have a, a major jewelry show coming next month from Chicago, different Chicago collectors. We have Festival of Trees coming up. Then we will close down the galleries for January while we prep the new museum, but we'll still have the auditorium open. We're going to fill it full of programming. Our gift store will be open. But in February 6th um, of 2025, right down the line, we're going to open the museum to the public with um, uh, showcasing basically our reinstall the permanent collection in the old museum. And then the new museum is going to be nothing but new acquisitions, including the Bennett Collection, which is a major gift from uh, our now top donors, um, Stephen uh, Alan Bennett and Dr. Elaine Malati schmidt from Texas. They have gifted us an extraordinary collection of 170 pieces. So we're going to show a big chunk of that. And all the other, we have a major New York collection coming that's been just gifted to us and all our acquisitions over the past three or four years that we've been holding under wraps. So it's going to be a brand new art museum in February. And that'll carry us through till May when we're going to open the, that major Julia child immersion experience where you literally walk through her life. It'll have her television studio in there, her home kitchen, everything. So we're not taking our foot off the gas pedal after we open. So this goes through to 2028 with a full schedule. Well, congratulations, and just a, a reminder, the museum is open. Come visit, uh, and in February, February 6th, wa- just prepare to be wowed. Really, it's going to be spectacular. Well, Kirk, thank you so much for being on the Muskegon Rising podcast. Thank you. For, for more information on Muskegon Rising, please visit muskegonrotary.org.